What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, board certified psychiatrist. So today I'm gonna to take a deviation from the previous material that I've been covering because sometimes that can be a little difficult and it's not as fun as telling an interesting story. And this is one that stood out to me as a resident, as a medical student, as the most interesting story in all of neuroscience and all of psychiatry because it's about an individual who taught us more about what the frontal cortex of our brain does than any other person could and than any textbook could. So this is a really interesting story about the American railroad foreman, Phineas Gage, if you haven't guessed already. He was an individual who had a very significant injury while working on the railroad where a tamping rod, which was used, and I'll talk all about it in this video, and it actually destroyed his entire left frontal cortex and the resulting behavioral changes and neurological changes that occurred afterwards were the source of much of our information about what the frontal cortex does and what its function is. Now, for the next 12 years after this individual had this injury, so not only did he have this injury, but he survived an additional 12 years, it led to things like friend, his friends saying he is no longer Gage, he is no longer himself. So this injury was so significant that it really changed his behavior and personality substantially. So this is the story of Phineas Gage, and this is the story of what the frontal cortex of our brain actually does for us on a daily basis. Okay, so let's try to understand the accident itself. So on September 13th, 1848, Phineas Gage was leading a group of men in setting explosive charges. Now he was a foreman of this group of men and he was responsible for them and what they would essentially do is be setting explosive charges to clear the rock or like mountainous regions that were blocking the pathway of the railroad. So their job would be to drill deep into the rock and then they would put explosive powder in the hole and they would put a fuse in there that they would eventually light to explode these rocks so that they could clear a pathway for the railroad, essentially. Now, what they would do though, after the explosive powder was placed and the fuse was set, they would pack it down with clay and other material and they would use what's called a tampening rod. And this tampening rod actually resembles a javelin, like one you would throw in a track and field meet. So it resembles a javelin and they would use that, they would smash down clay or whatever on top of the, um, the powder and the fuse so that the charge would dissipate in the direction it needs to and actually remove the rock or explode the sections that it needs to instead of going in the opposite direction. So essentially what happened at this point was that during this process, every, the charge was set and they were slamming it down with the tamping rod and the tamping rod actually hit the rock and caused a spark which ignited the fuse and the powder and it exploded. When it exploded, Gage was leaning over this, this hole, this drill, this hole that they had drilled, and the rod went straight through underneath his chin and through the left frontal cortex of his brain behind his left eye, and he essentially destroyed the entire left frontal cortex of his brain, and the rod actually landed, in fact, 25 meters away from the initial location, so you can see what kind of power we're talking about. Surprisingly, after the injury, Gage was able to speak within a few minutes, and he was even able to walk with little assistance. The doctor who was called to examine him actually didn't believe the story initially until he examined the exit wound where the, where the tampon rod had exited in his, brain, in his skull and was able to see brain tissue being coming out of the wound, at which point he vomited and then said, yeah, this definitely happened. So let's talk a little bit about the frontal cortex and its role in our daily lives because it plays a very, very important role for all of us on a daily basis. So imagine someone who is behaviorally disinhibited and prone to random acts of aggression. That's going to be a significant problem for everyone involved. Fortunately, we are lucky to have brains that have a mechanism that pumps the brakes and modifies those aggressive impulses before they become a problem and get us into trouble. So the frontal cortex is largely known for controlling impulsive behavior. When the frontal cortex is injured, say like when a tamping rod shoots through your head, it's like taking the brakes off of our impulses and allowing them to run wild. Now the frontal cortex exercises what we call top-down inhibition. So it uses top-down inhibition to control the more primitive subcortical regions of our brain. 
we can see how removing the brakes or removing that top-down inhibition would allow for the expression of emotions that would normally be withheld. Now, frontal lobe dysfunction is also one of the most consistent findings in humans who are known to have committed acts of violence. When we look at neuroimages of men with violent histories, many researchers have identified frontal lobe dysfunction, and this is not surprising as it plays a major role in the control of our impulses and our aggressive behaviors. So what evidence do we have that frontal lobe dysfunction leads to behavioral changes? Well, the most interesting study involves two groups of murderers. Now, what they did in this study was they took the individuals who committed murders that were essentially predatory violence. So when we're talking about predatory violence, we're talking about premeditated stalking of an individual to either kill them or sexually assault them, something like that. There's a thought process that goes into this, a so-called stalking behavior that goes into this. Or those who committed impulsive acts of violence, which are essentially where the person is perceiving some type of distress related to a particular individual and then lashes out at them, commits some type of act of violence or murders them. So they took the individuals who committed these predatory acts of, of violence and the ones who who did affective acts of violence, and they separated them into two groups, and they did a special type of neuroimaging on their brain called a PET scan, and they looked at frontal lobe activity and compared the cases and controls. Now, interestingly enough, both groups of murderers had decreased activity in the lateral and medial frontal cortex, but the more interesting part is that those who committed impulsive acts of violence had the least activity in the frontal cortex. So again, this is some evidence to support the idea that our frontal cortex is responsible for pumping the brakes on those impulsive acts. We also find a correlation between age, maturation of the prefrontal cortex, and the propensity for violence. In our society, the individuals who are least likely to commit acts of violence are of course the very young and the very old. Now, violent crimes increase until the age of about 18 to 22, at which point they subsequently decline. Now, part of this explanation is related to the idea that the peak levels of violence and subsequent reductions over time are due to a delay in maturation, in the complete maturation of the prefrontal cortex. So, essentially saying that it takes time to fully mature, in which case the breaks are not as good as they need to be. So there is a significant delay in the complete maturation of the prefrontal cortex, and this of course is accompanied by a fully developed and capable body for committing acts of violence, so this is a dangerous combination. Okay guys, so let's wrap it up here. So to kind of conclude everything, the effects on personality and behavior in the Phineas Gage story may be exaggerated to suit the needs of the individual observer. There is enough evidence though in the story that he did suffer a fair degree of impairment and change in both his behavior and personality. Now, we know that the frontal cortex plays a critical role in inhibiting and providing top-down control over primitive parts of our brain. And without the ability to pump the brakes on these impulses, we would not necessarily become mindless drifters incapable of caring for ourselves but there is a possibility that this could cause substantial social consequences as well as increased propensity for both affective and impulsive violent acts. So I'm going to go ahead and hold the video there, guys. I would love to see your comments and questions below. And if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so now. It really helps me to continue this thing.